Hello and welcome to the Switzer program. I'm Peter Switzer and uh, on a day when the market uh, snuck up, you, know, you would have thought it was going to be in negative territory, but no, it's continued to go higher. And what's quite fascinating is we've got a bull market being led by defensive stocks, which I'm going to talk to these guys about as well. Um, joining us, of course, is Julia Lee from Bell Direct and, of course, Michael McCarthy from CMC Markets. Let's start with you first, Julia. What do you think about that, the idea that we have a bull market led by defensive yeah. stocks? Well, I think that's a key here because, you know, we are seeing rates not only falling here in Australia but globally. So the search for yield is on and that's been reflected in the share price performances that we're, we're seeing at the mm. moment. I mean, in the financial year to date, um, you know, We've seen the Australian share market gaining about 7%, 12% if you include dividends. But the best performing sector has been telecom. Telstra is up more than 40% over the last 52 weeks. Mm. Um, and looking at some of the stocks reaching all-time record highs today, you know, they're real asset type of stocks. You've got Auckland Airports, which reached an all-time record high mm. today. And you've also seen highs for Goodman Group as well as GPT. And I think it's that falling mm. interest rate environment, which really does put the focus on these real asset type mm. of stocks. Maka, would you have thought that defensive stocks would have led a market high? Well, when you put it that way, Peter, it sounds funny, it doesn't does it? Funny. But it makes perfect sense because the two major drivers of the market at the moment are the lower interest rate environment and concerns about the trade disputes. Yeah. So it's logical investors would seek, because they're being forced into the market by the cheap money, they would seek domestic businesses. Yeah. And I think that's why we saw the telcos and the property trusts mm. do so well today. They're much less exposed to those trade woes. They pay dividends, generally pretty good ones. Yeah. And you know they, they'll benefit from a lower interest rate. And I have to say, I feel very guilty because I've been pushing you know, defensive income stocks for a long, long time, purely because I'm a scaredy cat when it comes to stocks, unlike you and your, <laughs> your red outfit and your aggressive trading techniques. But, you know, um, Peter, it's a really good point because, you know, five, ten years ago, people that were looking at retiring, you know, in five or ten years' time, mm. they would have been expecting to see a cash rate of at least six to eight percent, mm. and that would have been quite conservative. And mm. now they're looking at their bank accounts, what they can get in cash management yeah. and you know most people probably have to adjust their retirement plans to where the cash rate is mm. at the moment and that's really why this hunt for yield is happening mm. because you know record lows we've never seen them this low mm. here in Australia. Will it keep going uh, Maka or, or could there be a rotation that could sting a few people who go looking for income, they'll still get their income, but they might lose a bit of capital. Peter, we've been talking about this sign effect in the market, that is that wavy curve of sentiment for some time now, more than 12 months. And I expect that that will come back into play. We'll see a tilt back towards growth at some stage in the second half of this year. So. Um, Overall, the market looks healthy, Peter, and you're right to point out that that rise today, coming given the negative leads, is a sign of underlying strength. Um, people are worried, and so they've got high cash levels, uh, and they're being forced into the market. They don't like it, but that's the reality. And as uh, calm spreads, and, and as long as volatility stays lower, I think that that will, over the course of the second half of the year, spread back into the growth stock. So they'll have their chance as well. And we'll see the rewards, once again, going to active investors. Those people who are prepared to act when they get a stock that makes a good profit or buy in when a stock's under pressure. You were predicting this, the breakout, a few weeks ago. You, you, are you crowing in your, your, your local areas how, how brilliant and smart you are? Peter, I've been around long enough to know as soon as you start crowing, the market <laughs> kicks you in the teeth. <laughs> so, so I'm just trying to look for the next opportunity, Peter, and keeping it And cool. I do think that both you and I were talking 7,000 two years ago, weren't we, Macca? But the trade war and Donald Trump kind of brought us undone. Well, well, we've always been ahead of our time. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> We're heading in the right direction. Now, Julia, what do you think? Do you think this market's still got legs? Yeah, I think so. Look, don't forget that it's the end of financial year and you'd expect to see a little bit of action around the timing of the end of the financial year. But mm. the fact is that, you know, we have tariffs going on in the background. We have, you know, potential global slowing, interest rates possibly falling in the US in the second half of the year. And yet, despite this, the Australian share market is trading at decade highs. Mm. So, you know, the market's pretty resilient here. Don't forget that Australia, not only the Aussie dollar, but the Australian share market is also seen as a high yielding currency and market. Mm. So as yields fall, I think uh, markets like New Zealand and the Australian market will be very much in focus and trade more at a premium. Okay, but is it also saying that because the, and the market is something that buys ahead of what might happen in the future. Do you think the market, both of you, I want you to answer this question, 
uh, is saying we believe the second half economically will be better than the first half. Julia? I think so. I think the time to be looking at uh, domestic cyclicals is in the second half of the year. And mm. we've already seen a lot of those stocks start to run, especially the ones mm. that offer deep value. So one of the best performing stocks over the last three months has been Bingo. Um, we've seen a bit of stabilisation in terms of housing. And although there is still a little bit of volatility there, mm. Bingo share price, I think, is up by about 40% over the last three months. Sure. Well, another top performer is Metcash. Mm. Since December, it's up from $2.30 to $3.20. How yeah. can that do all oh, the troubles in, in supermarket retail? Well, exactly yeah. right, Peter. Well, it was pushed up. Pushed. Uh, uh, it was a value proposition, to be frank, Peter, and it's got steady earnings. Yeah. Okay. So today, any winners or losers that are worth talking about? Yeah, um, I guess AVO care was very much in focus, um, retirement homes, mm. the residential property, the difficult um, residential market also impacts on retirement housing. Mm. So it was a loser today? It was a loser. Mm. It was down around about 10%. Mm. Um, they said underlying profit was likely to come in at $50 million compared to the previous financial year, which was about $127 million, so less than mm. half of that. Metcash was in focus, of course, with its half-year numbers. Um, I guess one of the reasons that Metcash has been held up uh, relatively well is that um, it has seen cost cutting as mm. well as synergies helping to boost um, its performance but now some of that's worked its way through really needs to see that organic growth come through and unfortunately on the wholesale supermarket side it has struggled a little bit okay Mecca. I like Domino's today. That was really interesting. Up more than 4% on the news that the CEO is not leaving to go and head up a UK operation. So uh, I think that bounce today reflects the fact that it is in value territory for this stock. Near $40, it's at multi-year lows. And there is still real growth in this business, despite all those threats that investors have worried about from the Uber Eats and Deliveroo's of this world, Domino's keeps delivering. Pardon me, <laughs> pardon me. Um, but at, at $40, I, th I think it's worth having a look. And that response today, a bounce of 4% in what was really not much news at all, uh, suggests that it is in value territory. Julie, what do you think of Domino's? You know, this time last year we were talking about Domino's and we were talking about how hot it was in Europe so people didn't want to eat pizza. Mm. This time around it looks like weather patterns are relatively, you know, mild. Mm. Still 31 degrees in Italy at the moment. Mm. But, you know, <coughs> nice temperature. You could still eat pizza in that temperature. It's not the stifling hot type. So, look, I think Domino's, the European story is being, I guess, overlooked by the market. Mm. And in terms of pricing, it is a deep value play. The problem with deep value plays is sometimes that there can be more pain before the bounce up and you really want to see that recovery come through. But I think some of the conditions that impact on, on it last year, the extreme weather conditions, those type of conditions aren't there. So mm. hopefully we see a bit more growth. Okay, that, he's going for dominoes. What's the stock you like now? Uh, stock I like at the moment. Gee, I should have, <laughs> should have told you beforehand I wanted you to do that. <laughs> um, I was looking at a few stocks today. Um, a couple of different stocks, I guess. Um, one is Linus. Um, I still like Linus. Um, it is the G20 this weekend, yeah. so very much in focus. Hopefully we don't see an she escalation. She can be courageous at times, this girl. Okay. <laughs> really courageous, yeah. On the other side, one that I have held for a while and like for a while now is Nimax, and it continues to deliver. Mm. So that expansion story in terms of the US, um, mm. and I guess with a lot of these growth stocks, um, it is about the US expansion uh, story. Okay. Now, we don't have people get off Scott free. What do you think of her two selections there, Linus mm -hmm. and Near Maps? High risk, high, potential high reward stocks. Mm -hmm. Near Map, I find it very hard to get a grip on. Mm -hmm. It's travelling so far ahead of any earnings that I can see anywhere, even factoring in huge growth, mm -hmm. that I find it hard to get involved. But I said the same about Afterpay at $20 and it got to 28 So I'm not saying it won't go there. I just can't see the case to get me in. I'd actually prefer to talk about BHP. Now, I really make a call on one of the largest stocks on the market. And particularly, but I think it's important. I'm holding this, moment. mate. Give me some good news on this one. But well, exactly. I'm holding it too, Peter. And the reason the reason is, despite the fact that it's risen from $31 to trade above $41 today, I still think it's got more to go. And I think that we're going to see a test of the $45 highs. So I'm well, sorry, it's excitement to, girl. Oil oh, well, <laughs> is above 65 US a barrel. Don't forget that yeah. you know, BHP is not only a commodities based stock, but it's got that oil and gas exposure as well. So, mm. um, and iron ore prices in UN and terms are yeah, at all time it's highs. Looking great mm. today. Well, as Chevy Chase said to his son in American Vacation, Great talk, Rusty. Great stuff. <laughs> Julia Lee, Phil Direct, and Michael McCarthy Thanks, from Synergy Markets. Coming up after break, one of the legends of the Australian stock market, Anton Taliaferro, the founder of Investors Mutual. I caught with him last week before he went to Europe. He'll give you his views on where he thinks the market's going. Thanks for joining us, um, Mr. 
Anton Taliaferro, legend of the market. What do you think when I say that? I often say that. I think it's almost lunchtime and uh, you're about right. I'm a legend <laughs> of my own lunchtime. No, yeah. but you, you have had a history of um, being a successful fund manager. Is this the toughest um, stock market cycle you've lived through? Oh, it's getting pretty tough, isn't it? Because obviously rates are low mm. and uh, people are looking for ways to make money, to earn income. And mm. obviously, you know, uh, the stock market's one place they're looking now. But mm. um, the truth is, uh, you know, many companies are struggling. I mean, if you look at the banks, the Royal Commission, their margins are under pressure. Mm. And, you know, people are charging into CBA. So that now it's back to levels um, where it was before the Royal mm. Commission mm. and why, when housing was booming. So, yeah, and I, I guess people are getting desperate for yield. You know, it looks like there may be further interest rates to come. So, yeah, it, it, look, it, it is getting very tough. And, and that's the point, that people like you and me, when we, we came through the markets, we always had a pretty constant idea about what the interest rate was. And that interest rate became a benchmark if, if a if uh, a share price got too high, we'd say, well, hang on, why are we paying for this when well, we can get a simple 5% over here with no risk yep. whatsoever? Yep. Yep. But because the, that, that riskless rate has gone right down, yep. it does really mean that higher share prices can be suffered because the comparison is very different, isn't it? Well, yeah, as I said, if, if you're looking for income now in your retirement or whatever, it's very hard to know where to go, right? Yep. So cash is obviously not much of an option no. now, particularly as rates come down. Uh, to be honest, it's a it's an issue people all around you know in other mm. parts of the world have, have been grappling with for a while because mm. you know Europe's had zero rates for a while mm. uh, and their stock market hasn't exactly boomed either by the way but yeah. uh, you know Japan's had zero interest rates for a while mm. and you know Australia's heading towards sort of zero. Yeah. Okay, so you've got this, this rarity called unbelievably low interest rates. And you've got another rarity called Donald Trump. Yeah, he, he is. He, he would, for my, my purposes, he looks like the, the most difficult US president to invest with. Would you agree with me on that? Look, he's unpredictable, mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess you'd say. Um, some of the things he does are quite revolutionary, I suppose, in, in a yeah. world where things used to get sorted across the table. He likes to put deadlines and mm. operate uh, you know, as a a bit like a big bully yeah. making threats, yeah. but it sort of does work. I mean, you see what's happened with Mexico where mm. he threatened tariffs unless they tightened immigration and by the weekend the deal was done. You yeah. Know? So, um, yeah, look, he's just using the US muscle, I guess, that they have in trade to, to get the results he wants. Mm. But I, I think the market is, is not, uh, while Trump is, a, is an issue and, and, you know, he makes a lot of noise mm. uh, on this trade stuff, I mean, the thing that's driving markets is still this low interest rate environment. Yeah. That, that's the major <coughs> driver. But we've also got low economic growth where we're, about a year ago, we were expecting higher economic growth. The Treasury, uh, our Reserve Bank and Treasury thought we'd be growing over three percent. America was thinking they'd be growing so fast that interest rates were going to go up. I wrote stories that Europe were having more optimistic views on Europe. It's always I doubted, even though I typed it, I didn't necessarily believe it. But still, the world looks so much better. Is the trade war uh, has that been a catalyst? for the slow, slower grow global economy and therefore... Oh, partly, but again, if you look at the economies around the world, I mean, the US has now had a, an expansion of what, 10, 11, 12 years, mm. so it's pretty mature. Yeah. It's been pushed along by stimulus and tax cuts and, yeah. you know, their economy, it's pr pretty rare that they've had a 12-year economic right. uh, upturn. Yeah. So, you know, their, their economic cycle is mature, you know, their, their upturn is mature. Australia, we've had, you know, 30 years almost of... Uh, so that's the problem as well, is, is you know, cent uh, governments and central banks are trying to prolong mm. what is already quite an elongated economic cycle in both mm. America and, the U and, uh, and Australia. Okay, so how are you investing then? Like, w w what is the approach that you're taking? Like, for Look, it's, it's really tough. I, I mean, it's really tough. I, I think uh, what is clear is certain sectors of the market are very overheated. Mm. Uh, so, look, uh, the IT stocks, obviously, it's hard to uh, mm. justify, mm. you know, many of their valuations. If you look at the, the REIT, you know, the property trusts, where you've got, mm. you know, Mervac mm. at a 50% premium to asset backing, etc. Mm. That, that seems a bit okay. difficult to justify why, you know, you can buy a building for $1 and then the stock market is trading at $1.50, mm. right? So, yeah. um, so, look, you've got to stay away from the, uh, the... The banks, I think, are getting a bit overheated, CBA, mm. which is under pressure from, you know, their net interest rate margins. Mm. 
the share price is back to where it was pre-roll commission. Look, mm. it's got to pay a good yield, whatever, but the outlook is, is pretty tough. Mm. Um, so look, you've just got to stay away from the overheated areas as much as you can mm. and try and look for value okay. if there is any. Take right? us down the value road, the famous Anton Talia Ferro oh, Look, Peter, value it's road. difficult because some things look <laughs> cheap and they may get cheaper and, 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 and it's hard to know. And, and at the moment, the market is very much momentum, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it, if it's going up, it's exciting, whatever. So look, something like Caltex, and everyone go, oh, electric vehicles, and they're, they're, they're years and years away. And um, if you look at Caltex, you know, they're the largest distributor and, and, um, and um, retailer of fuel, mm. not just to cars, to trucks, to airlines, you know, they, they mm. look pretty solid, I yeah, think. Right. Good, good asset base, mm. they, they own many of their mm. petrol stations. Um, Two or three dollars a share in franking credits. To me, it looks it looks quite good. It pays a reasonable yield. Pays too. a good yield. Mm. Yes, it looks quite good. You mm. know, growing mm. in in different markets. Okay, you know, so. but give us something sexy like Caltex is. Yeah. Well, look, old, the old one school. we've bought, which has gone up, and and uh, is, is Nine Network. Mm. Uh, people will say, yeah, but Channel Nine's going down the doldrums, mm. and it, it it has problems. But Nine Network is not just Channel Nine. There's the Fairfax station. as well now. Yeah. There's yeah. Domain. Uh, the Stan, you know, she's growing quickly. Yeah, so true. those areas are growing pretty quickly. And mm. I mean, if you put Stan on a Netflix multiple, you know, you'd probably double the the nine yeah. uh, share price overnight. So look, nine looks okay, I think, mm. at, at, on, on weakness, mm. pays a good yield, good balance sheet, mm. good management. Mm. As I said, it's got one part of the business, you know, which is in, in uh, you know, sort of declining, which mm. is the free to air. Mm. But then other parts of the business, I mean, Domain, Stan, which are growing, you know. Okay. Now, you, you've been a great supporter of this company, and I was talking to Jeff Wilson, and, and Jeff said, did I, did I hear that, that Anton had given up on Pact? No, no, and no, I said, no. And I said, no, I don't think, if, if no. he had, I think I would have no, heard. I haven't given up. I mean, it's been it's very, very disappointing, yeah. there's no doubt. Cause, cause um, you, you've always thought it was a good company that was badly priced in the market. Well, it's, it, look, it, 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 the thing about Pact is it had this uh, a, a good, solid, um, Packaging uh, operation, you know, they're the largest rigid plastics uh, packager in Australia, mm -hmm. and they've used that to uh, go into new areas such as contract uh, manufacturing. So they produce a lot of the um, stuff for Woolworths and Coles, the non-branded stuff, mm -hmm. the house brands. Uh, they've also gone into pallet pooling, so they they do the pallet pooling for Woolworths now. They won that contract of Brambles, yeah. and they just recently won the Aldi contract too. So. They were making moves into what looked like good dairy. Unfortunately, the core business, mm. the packaging business, has been hit by the higher electricity prices yeah. because, you know, electricity prices have doubled. Mm. What PAC does essentially is it melts plastic to make containers mm. and that's, that's so a very... So they recycle plastic effectively. Well, that's, but it's a very electricity consumptive yeah. industry, yeah. so that's hurt them because it's been very difficult. I mean, one thing that's very clear about the current environment we're in is it's very difficult to lift your prices. Mm. Um, part of it is this low economic growth, mm. uh, low inflation. You yeah. know, it's very difficult if you have an input price that goes up to try and put your price up. And then, <coughs> you know, Pact has definitely suffered from that. But they have a new CEO mm. uh, who's come from the uh, places like Blue Scope and Orica, mm. where he turned them around. And his focus is to turn around the core packaging business. Yeah. The, the pallet pooling business is doing pretty well. The contract manufacturing business has also struggled with higher costs. But they put prices up, you know, which again, it's difficult to put prices up t to Woolworths and Coles because mm. nobody likes price rises at the moment, but mm. they've, they've managed to put them up. So we think uh, going forward, you know, the, the outlook hopefully will be better. Okay, so, uh, and, so and he said he's going to take 50 million of costs out of the okay. packaging business. So if a family member said to you, Anton, should I stick with Pact or should I buy Pact for the first time? What would you say? I would say definitely hold them. I, mm. I think at these levels, mm. I, I don't think you know it, it's trading anywhere near where it should be. Mm. Uh, and yes, look, I, I, look. The, the other week, the directors all bought shares. Now, mm. uh, either they're all you know <laughs> throwing their money down the toilet, or they're comfortable with with the outlook and uh, where the company's going and where the new CEO is heading. So, look, I think it looks looks fine. Um, all right. Again, it, this is one of the difficulties difficulties I think for investors if you buy things which are value mm. uh, like you said Caltex isn't sexy mm. uh, Pact certainly isn't sexy sure mm. you know you're not going to get mm. probably in the short term they're not doing well whereas all these other sectors you know your Wisetex and your 
Mervac and your CBA, that's where all the action seems to be, right? Mm. Because people are charging into mm. things that for yield, mm. but seemingly not really taking much notice of the price okay. they're paying. All the questions have been easy so far. I always give you one hard one, right? Let's, if someone said to you, Anton, I've never been in the stock market before and I'm, I'm really encouraged to go into it. Uh. Is, is this the time or would you say, <laughs> Wait for the market to crash and then go buy good quality companies after that Look, the, the, the problem, uh, as we've talked about before, is the higher the market goes, the more tempted and you know people come mm. in. And un unfortunately, it looks to me like the stock market, well, fortunately, I guess, it, 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 in many ways, it's going to hit a new record high. Mm. And the headlines are going to say, you know, stock market hits new record highs. Yeah. And often you'll find people who say, oh, wow, well, maybe I should put money in the share market now because it's going quite well. Yeah. And that's probably not the best time to be thinking about it, right? Mm. So I'd be a bit cautious. I think that, you know, the old dollar cost averaging, um, you know, buy straw hats in winter, all those things come to mind. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'd be a little bit cautious. I mean, it's, it's not dissimilar to, you know, looking to buy an investment property two years ago when everyone said the Sydney property market will mm. never go down. Yeah. Yeah. And here we are two years later and um, there's as much property as you like for sale. All right. Now... One last question. Um, a lot of people think, well, um, I'm going to be in the stock market for a long time. I might be a self-managed super fund investor. I'm 65. Hopefully, I'll live to 85. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy primarily good quality dividend paying stocks. Mm -hmm. And I reckon currently a lot of those people could get around 7% with franking credits. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. putting, putting together 30 good companies, I think you could average five, two yeah. percent franc rate. Yeah. So, and that's a lot better than term deposits. And if they're living off, on, if they've got a million dollars in their super, they're living on 70,000. My question to you is, if you, if you're, with your memory of what happens to stock markets, because I, I remember the GFC one in particular, where dividends didn't fall very much at all. I think CBA cut for one half year, then the next half year they increased it by more than what they cut by. And so dividends actually didn't collapse like share prices. Is this historically a fairly reliable strategy that if you get used to, say, 7% dividends during good times, maybe the worst case you might suffer in a big stock market crash might be 5%. Okay, so yes, you're correct. The volatility of returns from dividends is a lot lower than the volatility mm. of share prices. I, th yeah. I think that is the case. Yes. Um, it's again, let, let's say if you've got a million dollars today and mm. you put it in the market and you're happy getting your four, five, whatever percent, so you go, that's better than a term deposit. Yeah. That's fine. Mm. As long as you're prepared in the short term where that million dollars might be worth 900 or mm. 850, right. uh, which may happen if there's a correction. Correct. That's the thing. But your income levels should be relatively stable. Um, stable. Yeah. Again, you know, whether CBA cuts its dividend or not, we, we still have to see because mm. of the, its margins are under pressure. Mm. But yes, that's that's accurate. The dividends are lo less volatile than than mm. the share prices. Mm. But the, the key is whoever's buying today, if they're going to buy with that in mind, to not forget why they're buying. Because unfortunately, often what happens with people who come late to the stock market, mm. they say, oh, that's great. I'll just buy a million bucks or whatever, half a million dollars worth of shares and I'll put them away and not worry. And then there's a correction and, and guess what they want to do, Pete? Well, sell at the moment. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's the, that's the key. So mm. if you are going to take that longer term approach and mm. income is the thing, then you have to try and stick to that. And, and what you would, you would, I guess, prefer would be a person like that in the core of their portfolio, they might have a dividend strategy, but in the satellite part, they would buy your great funds to get that alpha return that you're famous for. Well, again, we're not an exciting manager. There's probably other guys who, who play those short-term yeah. trends better than us. I was trying us, to give, you, but, give uh, you a leg up there. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. But look, it, it, um, yeah, look, uh, as I said, uh, a, a portfolio based on income is not a bad idea. Uh, you just have to be aware that at the moment, you know, prices are, are a bit toppy. Yeah. Uh, they may go higher in the short term, but uh, and that you, you have to perhaps put up with that depreciation in value, mm. you know, if there is a hiccup. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's the thing you've just got to be careful. And what, what concerns me a bit now is, you know, the headline will soon be saying stock market at new highs. Yeah, and a lot of people are going to say, must be time to get in. Mm -hmm. And look, it, it's, it's difficult to say that, um, you know, the market won't go higher. 
But again, like the property market in Sydney was a, a couple of years ago, you know, there, was, there were signs then mm. uh, that it was a bit overheated and there are signs today that the stock market is overheated. Anton, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Anton Taliaferro, the founder of Investors Mutual. Well, everybody knows the name Magellan nowadays, but a lot of people might not know that Magellan also, apart from being a, a global investor in stocks, also has an infrastructure fund. And the person who's going to explain it is Emma Kirk, who, of course, comes from Magellan. Emma, thanks for coming to the program. Thanks for having me, Peter. Well, what's your, your position at Magellan? Do you run the show? Oh, no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. So, no. Hamish is the man. Hamish is the man and Gerald Stack. Yeah. I think what a lot of people don't Tell us about Gerald Stack. Gerald Stack. So Gerald Stack has been with the business since the beginning. So for <laughs> those people that don't know, Magellan started... 2006 and we launched two funds at the same time so 1st of July 2007 mm. which was a great time to start yeah. a fund yeah. we launched the uh, the global fund and we also launched um, our global infrastructure fund yeah. which Gerald Stack runs and mm. has been running since that time mm. so he's kind of the running mate for Hamish um, and uh, he does an amazing job in infrastructure okay and you guys have your own definition of infrastructure don't you we do we do so you, when you and I think about infrastructure, and you know, you love my Normal story. people. Yeah. Normal people. My yeah. normal story about infrastructure is infrastructure is something that it's an essential service. It's something that we use in our day-to-day -day lives, and most of us mm. don't realise it. So I always like to use me as an example on this mm. um, for, to explain infrastructure. Which is a very sexist example, if I remember. Your, your husband seems as though he's just getting it badly, but tell he us the story. He does, he does. So I, you know, I get up in the morning, yeah. I have a hot shower, I, um, my husband does make me an espresso on the espresso machine every day he yeah, does yeah. and then he cooks me up some eggs yeah. um, but there must have been a time when you were his slave when he was running that financial no, planning business no, he's, he's always been the slave he's always been the slave it's manservant <laughs> my wife calls him a manservant okay right he is. but on any given day i travel for work so yeah. travel around talk to investors and so i will generally get in my car mm. i'll drive down a toll road i'll park in the short-term car park at the airport mm. get on a plane when I land at the other end, I may use a train depending on where I land, and I'll mm. also return some phone calls mm. that I've missed along the way. So without even knowing it, I've used water, electricity, gas, toll road, communications tower, mm. airport, you name it. You're an infrastructure girl. Yes, I am. I love infrastructure. We and all are. <laughs> Not all girls, but we're all infrastructure people. We yeah. are, and we, yeah. we use it in our daily <clears throat> lives without even thinking about it. And so that's the broad definition of infrastructure. Yeah. Um, uh, all right, and your definition. Our definition. So there's a couple of things that we take off the table when it comes to infrastructure. So most people, when they think of infrastructure, they look at the physical uh, characteristics. They go, it's a big, ugly, capital piece of equipment and that's it. Hmm. And that's true, <coughs> but what we like to do is we like to take a number of risks off the tables. Mm. And the three main ones that we like to take off the table are commodity price risks. So yeah. if we've got a pipeline and the commodity that's going through the pipeline is being told on the value of that commodity rather than the volume, we like to remove that from our universe. Mm. Can you give us an example of what? Oh, so an example of that, so they, in the US they call them master limited partnerships. Right. And so whatever, if they've got oil or gas going through yeah, that okay. particular That's pipeline, mm. it's it's on the based on the value of that. And the price of oil, uh, if yep. you can predict that, then mm. great, very happy for you mm. to do that, but we're not experts at that. Yep. So we remove that from our universe. The next thing we take off the table is sovereign risk. Yep. So um, we know, for example, there are some great infrastructure themes, say, in China. Mm. China has got amazing themes around the number of roads it's going to build over the next five years. They're going to lay another 30,000 kilometres of roads. Mm. They're, going to have, um, they're going to increase the airports to 300 airports. Great themes there for infrastructure. However, uh, what can happen is if the government decides for social reasons to, say, make a toll road toll free on a public holiday, we won't get compensated yeah. for that. So we want to take that off the table. So it's government risk, isn't it? Government risk. Mm. And the last one is competition risk. Mm. We really like monopolies and quasi monopolies when it comes to infrastructure. Utilities and infrastructure, what's the difference? So utilities are uh, essentially um, gas, water, electricity. And electricity can include um, power generation and distribution. We like transmission and distribution, not generation. Mm. And when it comes to infrastructure, and utilities makes up about 60% um, of the universe of global listed infrastructure. When it comes to uh, transport infrastructure, you've got things such as toll roads, 
um, airlines, communication towers, satellites, mm. car parks, ports, rail, and then there's a very small component called social infrastructure, and that's uh, schools, prisons and hospitals, and that's essentially governments taking things off balance sheet and taking it out to the public sector. Combined transport infrastructure and social in infrastructure makes up about 40% yeah. of the universe. There. Is, there, is there any other screening process that makes you all that different from anybody else? Well, I think... There's what, quite a lot already, but there's anything yeah, else? Yeah, there's quite a bit that takes it out of it. I think it's our philosophy. We take a very long-term view when we look at our infrastructure assets. Mm. So we're not interested in the short-term movements of a particular stock price. It's about understanding the fundamentals of that business mm. and how it's going to perform over the long term. And we want, we want predictable, reliable cash flows. Mm. And that's really important because it means that whether the markets are up or down, we know that that cash flow is going to continue over time. Okay, so you, you take a lot of stuff out. So what's the size of your universe like? Yeah, so we start out, so if you have a look at the global listed market for infrastructure, it's about 3.5 trillion and it's made up of about 350 companies. By the time we apply our filters, we get down to about 130 to 140 stocks. And then from there, Gerald and his amazing team pick out 20 to 40 of the best stocks and put that together in an actively managed portfolio. Okay. Um, the outlook for the demand for these essential services around yeah. infrastructure, what, what do you think it's looking like? So for utilities, there's some amazing tailwinds. So particularly in the US, so in the US you've got regulated utilities. And what that means is that there's um, 51 regulators in the US. So there's 50 mm. for each of the states and there's a federal regulator. And the regulator actually sets what is the return that these regulated utilities providers can actually earn. It's not, so it's virtually guaranteed. Virtually guaranteed. Yeah. But what is interesting is that um, the managers of these regulated utilities, what they can do is they can actually increase that return by increasing their capital expenditure. So by upgrading their pipelines, upgrading um, water waste, sewerage, gas pipelines, they can actually increase their rate of return over time. Mm. And so we see in, in the US, they've got a very aged infrastructure mm. in relation to their pipelines. And so there are a lot of them are in the process of actually upgrading that, which is a good tailwind for them going mm. forward. As they upgrade, do they, do they effectively increase the price as well? And that's where they get their return, therefore yeah. you share in that return. So the regulators want them to actually upgrade that, particularly where we've had issues in the past where uh, certain providers of utilities have had uh, gas explosions mm. um, which have killed people and these are things that they actually have to take into account and the regulator wants them to do that. Mm, okay, so how can people access these strategies of yours that are wrapped up in this infrastructure is that fund of yours? Yeah, so um, our infrastructure funds are available as unlisted managed funds. So our funds have been going since the 1st of July 2007 mm. and then um, in 2015 at Magellan we pioneered the active ETF in Australia which is essentially a managed fund that trades on the ASX, it's an open-ended unit trust mm. and they can access our funds via an unlisted managed fund and we've got a hedged version and an unhedged version of our infrastructure fund mm. but our hedged version is available on the ASX mm. under the ticker code MICH or MICH as I like to call it. Yeah. Why is it MICA? It's Magellan. Magellan Infrastructure, Infrastructure Currency Hedged. Okay. Yeah. So, good way to remember it. And yeah. it's just as easy if you've got an online trading account or a stockbroker, buy it, sell it like any other listed security. Okay. So, given the history, what are, what are the expected returns on this fund? So, with <coughs> Infrastructure, we have, we have two objectives. The first is we would like to get CPI plus 5% through the business cycle. And we also wish to protect on the downside. So, and when we talk about protecting on the downside, it's the example I like to use is you start with a dollar. Mm. If the market goes down 50%, you're down at 50 cents. You've got to earn 100% to get back to where you were mm. when the markets fell. So for us, capital protection is really important, hence the reason why we take those risks off the table in our portfolio. That said, Gerald and his team have been able to achieve over five years, we're looking at 13.5% per annum. Mm. Over seven years, it's 14.2%, and over 10 years, 15.3% per annum. Is some on medication here? There, there's, <laughs> there's a very I big know, returns for, what, for largely what you think safe, yeah. kind of, you know, um, boring type uh, investments. Very, very boring, yeah. um, but it's a great... It's a great complement to both global equities and Australian equities. It's got mm. very low correlation to that. Mm. Um, and so it's a great additive to a portfolio, particularly if you're looking for something defensive. That was Emma Kirk from Magellan. And uh, coming up after the break, we'll be talking to Paul Rickard and Charlie Aiken from Aiken Investment Management on how they're investing right now.
It's the time of the program where we get together with two old blokes to, to talk about the market. And I've got to say, this came from a, a Google uh, comment. Apparently, three old blokes like Charlie's not old. You're yeah, middle aged, if he, anything. He's a little I'm, bit. I'm yeah. middle aged as well. But don't worry, we, we do have lots of other women in the program, so it's not just all old blokes. Charlie Aiken, Aiken Investment Management, Paul Rickard from the Switzer Report. I think your comment's very ageist, Peter, and I'm uh, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm pretty angry at that sort of. Yeah, fan okay. mail we're getting we're talking about our age Pete. take it up with your mp yeah. who, who, who won't give a toss <laughs> he won't give a toss all right what's fascinating me is that income stocks are going through the roof and you've got a view on this charlie haven't you yeah well i mean i call it there is no no alternative or tina i mean it's not a reason to buy to buy these stocks but it's it's a reason it's happening mm. i mean if you're a saver in the pension fund of super or and you're looking for investment income well there's nothing in the bank there's nothing in term deposits uh, hybrid yields have been bid down, it's everything. And it's a direct response to the Reserve Bank cutting rates and a direct response to forecasters forecasting another three rate cuts, which I think is way too aggressive. But, you know, mums and dads, people read this and they think they're going to have even less investment income coming from, you know, fixed interest and they just rush for, uh, rush for yield stocks. But I'd have to say, I mean, most of these stocks look very expensive versus their fundamentals now. So I think there is a little bit of caution required. I think a lot of caution required, Peter. I think people have gone crazy on some of these income stocks. Uh, look, I'm an income stock fan, but uh, when you've got Transurban's in the, trading in the $15, that yields now below 4%. That's not franked. There's risk on that. You know, they, they get, um, they've got, there are some issues there, right? So I think there is capital price risk on a lot of the income stocks. So the Transurban's, the Medibanks, the APAs, the Sydney Airport, all the property trusts. Uh, I think it's, you know, if, if you are chasing income, you've almost got to go back, I think, into some of the traditional stocks that have been beaten up. In a relative sense, I suggest things like banks are still a little beaten up. Okay, okay there's risk on banks, but we all know they're unloved. Earnings aren't going to grow, but there's still more certainly on some of the income there with perhaps well, less, honest, less capital price risk now than some of the income yeah, stocks. On, on that same theme, I think you could argue that resources look safer for income than, uh, than some of these income stocks. You've never said before. Well, well, you, you, saying, you actually I've coined the that. Your, you fa your father told you, oh, no. go tell, you, tell yeah, us what your yeah. father said. Never buy resource stocks for yeah. yield, and that's yeah. probably still right. Yeah. But even if you looked at them today and the prospects of further capital returns and buybacks versus their PEs and its justifiable valuations, mm. I mean, you can pay 105 times earnings for Transurban or 65 times earnings for Sydney Airport mm. or still muck around in Rio and BHP at reasonable valuations. I think there is actually an argument, like, like Paul said, for some non-traditional income stocks for income. Mm. So, but this is what it's got to. It has got, it has got a bit out of control, yeah. I'd say, and I think there is, there, is a, there is a time for caution. Paul, should people actually be trawling through the, the smaller caps, like the, 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 the companies between, say, 100 and 300, well, look, that I, also pay dividends, yeah, but, but they also might actually have some capital gains look, I, as well. I, th I think there are some sectors that just haven't actually done as much that are probably looking a little attractive. And so I'd put in that category, I think, some of the healthcare stocks. There's probably a little bit of appeal on that. I mean, look, CSL hasn't got a lot of friends, but, you know, it hasn't done much in the market the last month or two. There's, there's some value there. But there's but no dividends. And some people well, say, well, there are some dividends in some of those stocks mm. that, that aren't, you know, you've got to look at where the market has moved. The market has had this huge rally in property, and there's good reasons with property, not just interest rates, but commercial property rents in particular. And are, Bill Shorten have, have gone up, chased right? a lot of yep. people into rents. We've had, had in the industrials like Transurban mm. and Sydney Airport, the utilities like APA, uh, things like Medibank. There's a whole lot of stocks that you could say, you know, in the retailers, we've seen it in stocks like Coles, which West have gone Farmers. up, yeah. West Farmers. I mean, there are some other stocks out there that I think that haven't done as well um, where you should be looking. I'm not sure it's quite back in the small caps, but I think there is some value in, you know, I think banks are still unloved, Peter. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a fan of banks. Yeah. I know there's risk, but I don't think there's as much risk in those at the moment mm. as there are in buying a Transurban above $15 yeah. uh, or a ridiculous price for Sydney Airport or something. All right, what about a company like Stockland? It's obviously in the residential But, but Peter, they're, but, they're, but they've done, some of those companies have done the same. So mm. I hear what you're I saying. would say some of those stocks have, been, have never actually acknowledged there was a residential construction slowdown or residential housing slowdown. Mm. They're all at record highs, mm. people chasing their yields. And look, it's still uncertain whether you know, the property market recovers. Yeah. I mean, it's probably flattening out, but who knows where it goes back to. So look, I'm with Paul on this. If I'm looking to put money to work at any of the prices I see in front of me today in, in infrastructure, property trusts, anything that's got you know, basic uh, you know, defensive stock, I, I wouldn't be doing it. Mm. I think it's time just to hold fire there a little bit. I think stocks look very stretched, very expensive. 
And if for some reason interest rate expectations change, what happens if we wake up one morning, everyone decides the Australian economy isn't that bad, mm. and then we don't need to cut any rates anymore or for whatever? These stocks could lose quite a bit of their capital value. And, and what about um, if, if we you know, talk about the, um, the trade war implication? I, I think we've done mm. the interest rate story yeah. and the income story. Let's go to the trade war because the G20 meet is on this, this week. If um, Donald Trump and uh, Xi Jinping come out arm in arm after you know, consuming a whole bunch of dumplings, uh, and we well, go, and the trade war's over. What well, do you think is going to happen? Well, the, 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 the last thing you'd want to own in that circumstance, in my view, is a, a very defensive overpriced stock. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Transurban, Sydney Airport, property trusts, bonds would all lose value on that, on that, on a, on the can being kicked down the road or some sort of lessening of the trade so war. So the things like ten cents and all those well, other Chinese stocks would they benefit? Well, in theory, you yes, and, and resources would benefit, and anything anything Asian facing would benefit. But anything defensive that looks like a bond mm. would not. Okay. I so, think uh, I think by the time you get down to you know one and Australian ten year government bonds are yielding one point three five, the US is under two percent. I reckon bonds are in territory; they're not even worth holding, right? Yeah. And I think some income stocks are getting close to that level. Sometimes it's just better to get. You zero percent in cash at pink yeah, no and be patient, right? Too. No capital risk, right? Yeah. I mean, so I, I, I think you can, and there are some stocks out there, as you've said, Peter, maybe it's also in the small caps where you can get a five or six percent return still, and that gives you some comfort against the capital risk, okay. right? Okay, are we looking at a stock, stock market uh, period where the smarties will be taking profit, or do you think we still grind higher? Charlie, first. Well, it's interesting. I think at the moment things are very stretched. I mean, even I was just looking before I came in, NASDAQ markets bounced about 11% off its low this month. I mean, there's some big recoveries out there. You know, Australian markets up 16% year to date or something, not including dividends. These are huge moves. I don't know. When, I think when you struggle to put new money to work, there's, there, generally it's telling you that there'll be a chance to put new money to work at lower prices mm. at some stage. So, yes, the markets can still go a bit higher, but I think a lot of the moves happen, and I would be very, very cautious on some of these income-related stocks that are trading at, at multiples that are way beyond any, any uh, you know, justifiable valuation. Now, Paul, tra if a trade deal comes, is it sell the rumour? No, no, by I the think, rumor, no, sell the I fact. Think, look, the market has still got an underlying strength, Peter. Mm. Um, so I think trade deal comes, market goes up, right? Yeah, I yeah. don't think that's a sell. It may happen a couple of days afterwards, mm. once mm. the market has a bit of a rally, mm. then people start to cash out their chips. I think the FOMO factor, fear of missing out, is big out there yeah. at the moment. Uh, you know, I'm now getting a few people that I know nothing about stocks asking me about what's well, the time to get oh. the stock market. So the old, the old I, I, bellhop at the hotel. Well, that's, it hasn't quite got to that, Peter. But for the first time in a decade, I can report I think that we're getting to a what I'd describe a mature phase in our the rational market. exuberance sneaking Not, in. Not well. I don't know whether it's irrational rational exuberance. Maybe by the economist, Peter, and ha who could count the number of rate cuts coming. Maybe that's irrational. Yeah. Um, but uh, there certainly is some, ex I won't say it's exuberance, but we are getting to that stage where uh, people have been out of the stock market for decades and now thinking about getting in, so yeah. there's some of that. That's what's giving the market the strength. So I, I don't think the market goes down in the short term, but I do think you yeah. can be afford to be a little more patient I, I think and, just and just use your capital wisely. I think, I think it's highly unusual to have a bull market led by defensives. I mean, it is very rare. I do like the irony. Of yeah, it is. It's, it's so. It, it, go and read about that in a textbook. Yeah, yeah. That this bull market's been led by Transurban and Sydney Airport. Yeah. You will not find that in a in a in a textbook. Yeah. I think the bigger chance is that the market hovers around here, but there can be violent rotations between sectors. Yeah, that's important. And I think if bond yields move up or interest rates sensitivities change, or there is some sort of kicking of the can down the road in the trade war, mm -hmm. you could get a violent rotation from safety to risk. Mm -hmm. Now that may mean the index does nothing, mm -hmm. but risk includes resources, yep. banks small caps yep. and anything cyclical and that in itself could be could be more what happens than some giant market move okay so that's these are the the thoughts of you know three old three old guys right? sitting oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 and that's the show for this week thanks for joining us and uh, i'll try and find some younger people for <laughs> next week